pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is that roll call, Ryan? Ms. Medina? Here. Mrs. Rayon? Here. Mr. Cranes? Here. Mrs. Het? Here. Mr. Davis? Here. Mrs. Lee? Here. Mr. Bembo? Here. Thank you, Ray. We'll move on to the student representative's report. I think it's going to be Emily's last turn. Okay, so I have a lot today. Uh, prom, there was 675 students that attended um, and 320 spectators. Um, <laughs> but National Honor Society inductions were on April 30th, and um, so we inducted the new class, or to the senior class. Um, the Olympiad Awards were last week, Wednesday on May 7th, and I saw a few people there. Um, the Teen Leadership Awards were also on May 7th, and that was like the wrap up of their project. They did the Bike Share project. Um, the Bloodstone Ceremony, um, the dedication of the book, is, will be happening on May 14th. The Reality Check is on May 20th, and that will be in the Lincoln High School Field <coughs> House. <coughs> Scholarship night is May 21st, and graduation is June 1st, so that's coming up. Um, AP exams, we're into week two of AP exams, and people are ready to be done. <laughs> um, there was a presentation during an IE session um, to the sophomores about the trimester scheduling, and there was a meeting with AP sophomore like a smaller group of sophomores to discuss that um, there are some building improvements that happened there's some painting done in the cafeteria area the front doors are painted railings the sign out front uh, for student council of uh, state student council was really fun and they are going next year it was exciting it was definitely a different experience having it or being at the capitol so um, we also elected our new student council officers, and Melissa Schroeder is our president, and Holly Olson is our vice president. And the yearbooks are in, so our distribution date for that is May 23rd. Would you like to introduce here? Uh, this is Carissa Brunick, and she will be the student next year. Welcome, Carissa. Thanks. Thank you for having here. We're a friendly group. Yes. <laughs> and we have a presentation for you. A plaque that states an appreciation for service and leadership to the students of the Wisconsin Rapids Public Schools and serving as student representative to the Wisconsin Rapids Public School Board of Education. I want to thank you for your input. It was always interesting, and <laughs> Madison's game is our loss, so don't be a stranger. <laughs> Okay. I'd like to uh, ask that the May 5th meeting minutes be held up. All right, then I would make a motion to approve the regular Board of Education meeting minutes of April 7th and the Special Board of Education meeting minutes of April 28th. Second. Do we have a motion to second to approve the regular Board of Education meeting minutes of April 7th and the Special Board of Education meeting minutes of April 28th? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And then as far as on the May 5th meetings, I'd like to uh, let you make a correction you know, before we you know, try and give a final agreement. Um, upon review of the minutes I had at the meeting, special meeting in the open session, I'd like to clarify that my intention at the meeting when the voice vote was taken was to abstain <coughs> from voting. When the voice vote was called, uh, John only heard the A's and the, or the I's and the nays. I did not participate in the vote, but rather abstain from voting. While I did not verbalize my absent abstention at the meeting, I am requesting that the May 5th, 2014 minutes be amended to reflect that I withheld from voting on the 1% base wage increase for the WRE bargaining unit for the 2013-2014 contract. I guess I'll just remind board members in the future if you're going to abstain to please verbalize that so we know. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So is it a motion to reflect that? I would think so. I would uh, move that we approve the special board of education open and closed sessions meeting of May 5th, 
with an amendment to the open session minutes to reflect that John Denbo abstain from voting on the WREA increase. Second. 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 Okay, we have a motion and second to approve the amended uh, meeting minutes of open and closed session on May 5th, 2014. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Oh, we need roll call on that? So it's what's in the page then. All right, I apologize. Can we please have a roll call on that? Mr. Cranes? Yes. Mrs. Medina? Yes. Mrs. Rail? Yes. Mrs. Kett? No. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mr. Bembo? Yes. Thank you, Marie. Okay, so we're meeting minutes are approved then. We can move on to comments from citizens and delegations. Do we have any tonight, Marie? None. Okay. Moves us into community reports, John. Business services. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, business services met at 6 p.m. on May 5th, and we only had one consent uh, agenda item at the table. Uh, it was the very time proposal again, it was brought forward, but uh, uh, we still had not seen the information uh, that we had requested on the last time. And I also uh, decided, or we decided as committee, that we'd bring this forward to the full board. Um, probably next month's meeting uh, for, discussion, uh, for discussion and then also the presentation that they're going to give. Uh, during the meeting, you know, I got in a packet the questions that, we, that I had, the committee had, and then we also were provided uh, the, some of the documentation from why we're looking at this program um, from Dan and Business Services, and then we'll have a, a full presentation as to justify this at the, the full board meeting, and then we can act on it at that time. I just thought it was too, too important of a purchase that just the committee would look at it. I'd rather have the whole board look at it and hear the information all together rather than have it to the committee more forward. Okay. <clears throat> and then uh, the further on that, we had updates uh, of purchase review. We had the uh, uh, invoices for computer equipment purchases, police liaison services, occupational therapy services, and build your own correction fees. And then uh, the following, the last purchase is my favorite one, the copy paper update purchase, uh, which uh, surprisingly only had three bids out of the five vendors. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, but we still had, uh, we still under $20. And then for a future uh, agenda item, we sent um, the date for the trade hall tours, which is June 2nd at 4.30. And then we also are working on dates for transportation negotiations. With that, I would uh, recommend that the committee recommends that we approve the minutes of the meeting with the Business Services Committee. Second. Okay, we have a motion to second to approve the meeting minutes for Business Services Committee meeting of May 5th, 2014. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, thank you, John. Yeah. <laughs> you know, of course, these questions for Veritime proposal. And one of them I have maybe can be asked when it's presented is um, will we save enough to offset the thirty the eighty five hundred dollar annual fee? I guess. You know, is it gonna be a money maker? We're not gonna lose money on it? I guess it's my chance with that question. And exactly what employees will be covered? What I look at I see three hundred and one right now. Maybe I'm not counting or I'm counting too many groups, I got enough groups, I don't know. Okay, next we'll move on to personnel services. Okay. okay, personnel services met last Monday, May 5th, and we had a really, really long meeting. <laughs> and we had people coming to visit. And out of that meeting, we have 9% agenda items, and they are as follows. Uh, the committee recommends that I move to approve the one support staff retirement. Secondly, the committee recommends that I move to approve the one professional staff resignation. The committee recommends and I move to approve the one support staff resignation. Fourth, the committee recommends and I move to approve the one leave of absence request. Fifth, the committee recommends and I move to approve the two professional staff appointments. Sixth, the committee recommends and I move to approve the two student appointments effective May 19th and the one student uh, appointment effective May 28th as district summer ground workers at the rate of $10 per hour, 40 hours per week, 7.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Seventh, the committee recommends and I move to approve the 
15 clerical aid support staff appointments for the 2014 summer school program. Eight, um, the committee recommends and I move to approve the appointments of four students to the position of summer technology support for 2014 at the rate of 925 per hour, starting no later than June 9th and finishing no later than August 29th. Starting, early. Starting no earlier than June 9th. Okay. Um, and then we have number uh, consent agenda number nine, and that is approval of various policies. And these are for second reading, so there haven't been any changes from first reading. But they are policy 731.2, use of electronic surveillance technology in public areas and school buildings and property. Policy 751.21, use of electronic surveillance technology on school bus. Policy 443.3, smoking and or use of tobacco nicotine products by students. 522.2, smoking and or use of tobacco nicotine products by employees. Policy 831, smoking and or use of tobacco nicotine products on school premises. And finally, policy 345.11, Procedures for Academic Excellence Scholarships. Does anybody want anything held out? I'll second those motions. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda items PS1 through 9. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. And then we have some discussion and update on um, uh, a staff assignments for the coming year. Um, we had some correspondence concerning um, the guidance ratios uh, losing. Um, we were having a um, guidance retirement, and one of the positions will not be filled. There will be a reduction of one guidance position, but that is going to be felt across the entire district. It's going to be de dealt out that way. Um, just for, um, we still have a very good student ratio when it comes to uh, the ratio between guidance counselors and students. We are better than DC. Point in Marshfield. Um, there's Arrowhead High School, which has 2,300 students, and they have six counselors. That makes a ratio of 383 to 1. With our reduction for next year, we're going to have a ratio of 290 to 1. So we're still in really good shape, even though we're reducing 1. Um, there will be an elimination of a special ed position. Um, three librarians were retired, we'll be replacing two. Um, staffing the RTI interventionist position um, in math and language arts at Lincoln High School. This is going to be reduced, but it's going to be increased at the elementary level. So it's just a shift of the positions, even though the, the FTs will remain the same. Um, we still have some openings yet at uh, three first grades in a kindergarten. And there will be some, perhaps, elementary staff reductions and shifting still going on. That's still being worked out with retirements and things coming in. Um, with that, I move that the minutes from the May 5th Personal <coughs> Services Committee meeting be approved as printed. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the meeting minutes of the Personal Service Committee of May 5th, 2014. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Oh, thank you, Sandy. Next, we have Ed Services and... Thanks, Jim. Ed Services met last Monday, May 5th at... Um, Oh, I don't know what time. Oh, 6.44. <laughs> I just thought. <laughs> there was no public comment. Um, we have two consent agenda items, um, and I wonder if anyone wants either one of them held out. Okay, our first consent agenda item was on elementary science acquisition, which is the first phase. Dave Bergeson, who is our WRPS science coordinator, reviewed uh, attachment A in our background, which sets out materials acquisition decisions to support the revised elementary science curriculum. He pointed out that the majority of the grade levels will use items purchased from National Geographic, Delta, Founda or Delta Education, and Engineering is Elementary. Uh, Katie Bilski Medina questions why some grade levels were purchasing more items than others. Uh, Dave, noted that at some grade levels, current materials are still appropriate. Sandy had asked about the number of parents or community members that attended the materials display, and Dave noted that no one attended. 
Kathy Stebbins hints our director of curriculum thing today for offering several professional development opportunities this summer which will familiarize elementary teachers with the revised science curriculum and the new science materials. So as a result of that discussion, our review, we recommend approval of phase one of the elementary science acquisition not to exceed the amount of $174,900 to be paid with curriculum acquisition and referendum dollars. Um, then we went on to our agenda planners for 2014-15 and Kathy Simmons hints introduced um, administrators from the secondary schools to review proposed changes to student agenda planners. She asked board members to address any grammatical or formatting changes with administrators after the meeting. Patty Riche, assistant principal, presented for East Junior High. Ron Rasmussen, principal, uh, presented for Lincoln High School. And Brian Oswald, assistant principal, presented for Rams. Administrators went through the proposed change, changes and explained uh, reasoning for the changes. And after that discussion, um, we recommend and I move to approve the proposed secondary school agenda planner changes, including any changes discussed for the 2014-15 school year. And I would say we recommend and uh, make the motion to approve uh, ES1 as well. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve ES1 and ES2. Marie, can you please have roll call Mrs. Rail? Yes. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mrs. Hett? Yes. Mrs. Medina? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mr. Cranes? Yes. Mr. Bembo? Yes. Okay, we continue on with updates, and Kathy Stevens hints presented the 2013-14 WKCE results. <coughs> Overall results were very good. WRPS is ahead of the state average in all areas except 7th and 8th grade math. The board requested more data on the following. Uh, longitudinal data for some student, for same student groups. Longitudinal data for uh, ELL students, achievement gap between males and females if there is one, and impact of students not tested and virtual students. We went on to uh, talk about the um, WSAS, which is, stands for Wisconsin Student Assessment System for 2014-15, and Kathy reviewed the significant changes in student testing for 2014-15 Several assessments will be added or modified for the upcoming school year. Information was shared on the Smarter Balance Assessment, ACT Aspire, ACT, ACT Work Keys, Dynamic Learning Maps, Access 2.0, PALS, and WKCE. Administration is concerned about the impact the additional testing will have on technology availability and instructional time. And with that, the committee recommends and I move the option of the minutes of the May 5th Educational Services Committee meeting. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the meeting minutes of the Educational Service Committee meeting of May 5th, 2014. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Thank you, Next, we have agenda referrals and information requests. Anybody have anything? Okay. Move on to our legislative agenda. Do you have anything for us? Yes, I do, John. <coughs> I'd like to share a couple of issues uh, that were included in the legislative update. I went on the WASB website um, from May 9th. And the first one that was I found interesting was uh, an assembly task force that spent several months researching challenges facing Wisconsin's rural schools released its long-awaited report this week. Uh, in his recommendation, Rep Representative Rob Spring, who was a Republican from Rhinelander, was the task force chair. He called for creating a new version of the TEACH program to provide more funding for broad, broad, broadband access equipment and training to facilitate technology-empowered learning in rural schools. Other task force recommendations um, included providing more state aid for transportation, tweaking state-imposed revenue limits to use a five-year enrollment high rather than the current three-year average, and applying a weighing factor for school enrollment in small school districts. Um, it also included allowing school districts to fund co-curricular activities using community service levies, which would be Fund 80. 
um, freeing small rural districts from certain mandates, authorizing school districts to adopt whole grade sharing agreements as an alternative to consolidation, and creating a loan forgiveness or grant program for rural teachers as a way to help rural districts attract and retain, retain quality teachers. However, the timing of the release of the report, um, the legislature adjourned until January, so that means there will be no legislative action likely until the 2015 at the earliest. But the representative did say that he truly believes he put what he put in the report <coughs> will have serious traction in the next session. He believes it's a step in the right direction. And State Senator, oh, State Senator, State Superintendent Tony Evers commended the bipartisan support for advancing rural education. Um, as always, one of the major challenges will be to find the resources to adequately fund the recommendations that have costs attached. Uh, Democrats who served on the bipartisan task force had released their own their own report. Um, they say the report doesn't address declining enrollment and flaws in the state funding formula. And in an interview with reporters, Speaker Voss said the reason they wanted the report done at this time was to work with the governor to prepare for his budget for next fall. He says we want some of these things to be included. Uh, Voss also said following the budget, he will focus on educational issues in the next legislative session, such as school accountability, expanding school choice, and even reevaluating school funding. He's also open to looking at tweaking the funding formula. <clears throat> I guess we'll need to continue to stay alert and pay attention. Um, the, other, the other issue, um, Assembly Speaker Voss addressed the State Republican uh, Convention last weekend in Wisconsin, and he voiced frustration over the compromise on voucher schools that passed the legislature last year as part of the 2013-15 state budget. The deal expanded the voucher system statewide but capped new participation to 500 students in the first year and 1,000 in the second year and thereafter. Voss says we should never have had a cap. The next time around, the cap will be gone. In his address, Speaker Voss also criticized the National Common Core Education Standards, policy that has drawn fierce criticisms from Tea Party activists who describe it as a federal takeover of local education. Uh, Voss says we don't need Common Core because Wisconsin expects higher standards. So I guess we need to, I thought maybe that was going to change. I think I've heard him speak a little differently. But we'll have to see what happens. Mm -hmm. So we can move on to bills. I would make a motion that the receipts be noted and the bills be paid as printed. We have a motion in this second that the receipts be noted and bills paid as noted in our packet. Uh, Marine, can we please have roll call? Mr. Bembo? Yes. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mrs. Rayle? Yes. Mr. Krings? Yes. Mrs. Medina? Yes. Mrs. Hat? Yes. Thank you, Marie. Can I have a, I have a question? Yes. Um, Looking at what we pay for um, unemployment insurance, we always pay, uh, let's see, we pay one month in arrears. We pay as we go. And we're looking at like in January, we paid $244. Then for February unemployment, it was $1,230.30. And for March, it's $1,536.91. And I, in personal services, I haven't seen a lot of people losing their jobs, so it's being accounted for by? The, the state accounts for it. But when, who's making the claims? The claims are coming from a number of different sources. One of them is this one. Yeah. Um, one of them uh, is sub-teachers, a small, small amount of that. Uh, some of it is a coach uh, who apparently must have been laid off from his regular job but then he also collects against us. Um, another one is, um, let's see, a student who worked for us last summer is collecting uh, as a summer helper. Um, and uh, then there's the regular other sports staff that uh, have worked for us in the past. But why would it increase? I mean, it was only 244 if that was you know, a student from last summer. Some of those people have been just laid off. Uh, for instance, a coach, I believe. So, I mean, some of those things have just, it must have occurred recently. So this, for example, it, it, it may be through other employment that they've lost right, their job, yeah. and then what, what they do is they go back on every employer that they've had within a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. So we don't always control that. Okay. Um, when it comes to substitute teachers, how many days, is it consecutively or um, cumulatively that do they have to work in order to collect? 
there is no cumulative minimum per se, but but they have to reach a certain amount in order to collect from us, and I don't know exactly what that amount is. But uh, the majority of our subs do reach an amount where if if they wanted to, I think they could collect against us. If they're if they're working on a regular basis, they're working every week. Um, if they're working one day a week. I mean, how? Well, well, I don't know what the exact exact amount is. They have to work. Uh, they have to work um, six months or something like that before they can mm -hmm. come back against us. And um, I don't know how many hours they have to work in that in that period of time. It, it depends upon their their recorded earnings and. And one of the examples in which that can vary would be our sub teachers who are normally working irregular intermittent amounts of time and then all of a sudden we have uh, we have an opening because of a medical leave for example and we put somebody into a long-term sub position and now they work every day for an eight-week period now the regular employee returns to work that that sub who normally might be working three or four days a month who is now worked every day for eight weeks that becomes their, their uh, there's a new calculation for what their, <coughs> what their monthly income is and their potential unemployment goes way up in, in those situations. So, but to come back to your original question, it's, it's people who are working in limited term positions for us that in the last few months, the figures that you talked about, it's all employees that have worked limited term assignments. It's, it's not any of our people who would have been laid off mm -hmm. for the previous year. The other thing about the subbing is they don't necessarily have to just sub for our district. They could be subbing with other districts to accumulate the number of hours they need. So in other words, they could be working for Stevens Point or Macusa or, or And district. so what district would be paying all the unemployment? Of, all three of us could be paying. Yeah. We'd be responsible for our portion. Whatever they report yeah. is income they receive from us. That's just like the example that, that Dan referenced before. If it's if it's somebody that's working in a, in a job in the community and they're also they're a, a ninth grade girls basketball coach for us, for example, and they're laid off from their regular position, they're asked to report their earnings, what they made from us as a coach would be included in, in their earnings that we would then become responsible to pay unemployment for. And so for how long? As long as they're they're laid off, I mean, there's there's a set period of time. I mean, if they, they could be out of work for a month, they get a new job and then it stops. Right, but we had. Um, you know those all those extensions of unemployment within the last year would we be obligated to pay that during all those federal no, I mean if you're referring to for example the, the teachers that we had non renewed the previous school year no not the non just you know just the in unemployment the compensation in itself had many extensions in the benefits in the benefits would we are we subject to all those extensions too as as long as the state is liable, I mean, as long as we're liable under the federal law, yes, because the state would have to pay that. I think the one thing that people don't understand, our employees don't understand, is that it comes directly out of our budget. We are not like private employers who send money down to the state and there's a pooled mm -hmm. amount. I mean, we pay, as you said, as we go, and so it comes directly out of our fund end. And even though we pay as we go, about two, three years ago, we just got accessed $18,000 for interest in interest on the pool that's coming yeah. yeah. okay. I guess I just have some problems with it as you can tell we're, we're frustrated too <laughs> just, um, wow well, is there a, okay <coughs> can we get a recap of what we paid for unemployment in the last 12 months sometime when it's when it's convenient then I don't know if you can break it down or not, but just by categories of well, just or versus people stuff. that were truly let go of their job from the district and those that <coughs> lost some other job and are also recouping from us. I'm just anxious to see. Okay. Or perhaps the difference between what was the irregular job versus the the limited term and positions yeah. we talked about. Like that. Okay. Okay. That's all. Thank you. That puts us into new business. Our first item for discussion and possible action to approve recommendations concerning the 2014-15 district budget shortfall. If you would take a look at the um, brief sheet that at the very bottom has 238 on it. Um, 
I'd like to do is just walk you through um, the, the first portion of, of this will be um, how we came to the deficit that we were currently trying to meet for next year. Um, our declining enrollment in amount was one million two uh, hundred thousand. Health insurance, um, Affordable Care Act is what ECA is standing for there to be compliant. Um, we're looking at a million fifty-three thousand dollars in renewal. Our dental insurance, and dental insurance is going to be a forty-two thousand eight hundred fifteen dollars renewal. Um, supplemental pay that's DEUs and credits that teachers take, and um, some years ago we approved paying one hundred twenty-five for each and up to six per employee, and so we calculated the total amount. Um, and I'll come back to that in a little bit, but that's that would be the total amount of three hundred fifty thousand. Uh, transportation will be another expense. We don't know what that might be yet um, because that has yet to be negotiated. And I think Dan will be talking to committee members at calendar time towards the end of this meeting um, to, to confirm a date. Um, and then finally, um, staff raises. Um, first sheet I gave you was a 1.66, that was this year's. So that was an error on my part, and it's a 1.46. That total is 463,827 if we were to go forward. So that would be the full deficit of um, $3,112,607, plus any transportation expense. So how did we how did we get there? And, and we think we're very close. Um, in order to meet the deficit, we looked at um, what savings we, we had, and Ed informed me that at the Boys and Girls Club we were saving approximately $20,000. Um, in food service, Julie Moody is funding something um, differently, and so $6,000 worth came out of the general fund and went into the food service fund. Um, department and building budgets are all going to be cut by about $100,000. And I want to tell you um, that these numbers aren't exact to the penny, but they're very close. Um, you know, they, they may alter a little bit. Um, maybe it's $19,999 instead of $20,000, but we sort of round as we work through this. Um, special ed um, preschool dollars, there's going to be a shift there, um, which will save Fund 10, again, the $12,000. Um, with the snow day, um, it's about $25,000 a day, so we had two of them that we did not make up. That's $50,000 that we saved. Um, doesn't account for the the next two, and we'll get further down. I have another amount um, in into the OPEP fund um, due to the change the board made a couple of years ago with regard to how we pay that in um, for teachers and what we pay the 85 percent of the set set amount. Um, Dan indicated he put about 203,800 dollars less, um, so that's that's a savings for us. Um, some of the stipends that go um, to department chairs, CII um, chairs, and, and cadres and buildings um, will be reviewed. We anticipate a savings of about twenty thousand. Um, HRA, um, we had some carryover from last year and additional savings this year to the tune of a million two, which is really big, and that's really the biggest help that we have. We don't anticipate carryover into next year, so that that dollar amount will be diminished next year. But hopefully, it will continue to save us. The staff retiree savings, um, its resignations and retirements um, all bundled in together. In some cases, as Sandy alluded to, we're not replacing people. Um, for example, one guidance counselor and one librarian piece were recommending that we not replace those and that just through attrition, natural attrition, we have some savings. Um, we also have um, a couple of resignations that we're suggesting we not replace. Um, I think one or two, one is in the special ed area. Um, we also cut a position in special ed. It was um, an IEP coordinator position uh, that was technically put into place when we had an audit some years prior to my being here. Um, and um, we've gone through the audit, and um, those duties will be passed on to um, Leslie and Trudy. They'll be absorbing those duties. So that position we um, recommend cutting, and the individual then retired um, indicated that that was was how she would proceed. Um, there's one other position I think that we're not, Ryan, can you think of that we're not replacing? I can't think of what it is off the top of my head. Building and ground? Well, we had, well, that's that's coming under clerical. Okay. Um, how many special ed positions did you refer to? Oh, we have, well, we have one that, we have one that's 
that resigned and were replacing, but we're not hiring from the outside. We're moving people internally. Um, we've had no layoffs or non-renewals this year um, because what we're doing when somebody resigns or retires, we're either not replacing or moving people internally and making the cuts that way. So we, we are estimating that we're at about um, 584,000 uh, in savings there. With the clerical piece, that savings comes from, um, Ed had a secretary resign, and um, we have a partial savings there because what we've uh, done is ask um, Kim Schenk, who works at the PAC and is our athletic director secretary. She works seven hours a day. We've asked that she work eight hours a day and um, pushed her year round rather than her usual calendar or school year job. Um, so she's picking up some of those duties and we're just kind of doing it on a trial basis um, to pick up the, Cindy um, Rudke was at Buildings and Grounds and she, a lot of her uh, position was doing the facility rentals and Kim has picked that up. Um, name badges was another piece and we're still, we're still kind of feeling our way through that to see if, if maybe HR is going to pick up doing name badges upon hire. Piece. Um, and so there are some other duties as well. But Kim is kind of back and forth between the two locations right now, and it's, it's kind of on a trial run, but we think that we'll be able to make it work. Uh, the deductible change, um, we are suggesting a, de a deductible change that would save us about $229,000. And uh, the current deductible for staff is uh, $300,000, We're suggesting a $500,000, and we'll be talking about that, uh, explaining that to you in a bit. The possible less makeup day, uh, I put that in, in that way because I wasn't sure that we were going to not come back that half day at the end, but with minutes being reviewed, um, we were able to cut, cut that short. Um, so that's another $25,000, and that's essentially the busing that we don't pay then, and food service personnel don't come in, that doesn't affect us. You know, our budget directly, the clerical doesn't come in, so the overall savings is about $25,000. We are getting um, increased categorical aid. Um, we had $75 last year. We're getting another 75 on top of that this year, um, totaling 382,000 or 382,000. Um, so we have a, uh, towards a deficit of about 2,870,000, leaving a deficit um, of $238,153.92. However, that number will be somewhat higher because we don't know what transportation is going to be. But it does not include, if you go back up to that supplemental pay, we don't anticipate paying out that full amount. Um, last year we paid out 86,000. Um, we think it might double this year, uh, could be more than that. We're, we're not clear on what that amount's going to be, and we won't know that till September. But that could help, you know, depending on what we pay out there, the difference would then go, of course, towards the deficit, what we don't pay out. Um, there may be some further staff savings um, as we're working through the final final uh, steps in that. And then finally, um, we'll be coming to you in short order in June for a levy setting meeting. And at that time, we're going to recommend that we do levy for debt service, which we have not done in the last couple of years. And um, we've been paying some of the debt right out of the general fund. Well, that would be about $375,000. So that alone would eliminate what you see here at the bottom as a deficit. So at this point in time, I would ask if there are any questions or concerns, um, and if, if not, to go ahead and approve what we've done so far, and that we would then come back to you regarding that $238,000, um, and perhaps at that June budget hearing meeting. John? Just like I have one question. On the department building budget, uh, spread out among all the schools is probably uh, not as significant as it could be. But is that going to shift? Is that something that would shift to teachers to get rather than go without? If they need well, something for their classroom? Well, that's hard to say. Um, and the reason I say that is that it, it really depends on if, if a department um, Say a, a school like Lincoln, for example, loses ten thousand dollars. You know how Ron decides to distribute that. Then what's with what's remaining is going to be at a building level, and it you know it may vary. Um, teachers are we buy stuff anyway. <laughs> um, 
but it's not intended to shift to teachers okay. that, it's, that then becomes an out-of-pocket expense. I mean, we will certainly be purchasing the things that, that you know, they need to do the job. Mm -hmm. And the department share 20000 is that going to um, uh, weaken that to the point that people won't want to take those positions? That may happen. I don't know. Or is, it a, is 20000 a significant part of that? or? What is the total? About 40? About 40,000? The bulk of that is, is the department chairs. Yeah. And we're looking at adjusting the, the state and schedule, um, which could, could equate to, you know, we looked at it, yeah, I think it's about $500 per department chair re reduction from what they're currently getting as a stipend. We have a we have a stipend schedule where they're, they're paid a stipend um, depending upon how many people are in their department. And I think the, the low end, it's a $1,000 stipend. On the high end, it's, it's $2,500 stipend. You know, so someone who has a department of, you know, three or four people may get $1,000. Someone who's got a department of 12, 13 would get 2500 And we're looking at reducing that schedule across the board, $500. So that low end would be 500 The next step is 1000 and so on, with 2000 being the cap. Is it accurate to say that what's going on now with all of the changes in uh, ways of measuring things, they have to work harder than they used to and with all the stuff that's coming down. I, I think that's the case with every position in the school district, every position in the school district. I think that's true, Larry. Yes. I remember that coming here before, didn't we lower that before? We, oh, like a year or so? Or maybe um, I think it's been longer years. than that. Three years. Three years. Has it been that long? Mm -hmm. It hasn't been since like we, yeah, I thought I it made pretty like, we, used, we used to have, I think, a percentage system similar to co-curricular contracts, and we went to the stipend system, which was a, a reduction, yes. So this would be a second round of reducing the, um, the compensation for those assignments. Um, I have concerns and in um, Ed's department. He's going from a full-time secretary to one that's just adding an extra hour a day. He has two full-time secretaries. Oh, okay. There. So one is, is still there. Okay. And the other one we're, we're subsidizing, or not subsidizing, but filling in with, with this other individual who will work year-round, and she has not in the past. Oh, okay. So, um, we don't know yet how it's going to go, Sandy, so we may be coming back to you to say, we really need a half-time person there in addition but we're not sure because just having been toured that in December it's like holy cow it is massive and complicated the whole none of these are popular <laughs> <laughs> and it's not going to get any easier next year either um, we're already looking at you know at least two million dollars in deficit so we're going to be right back to the drawing board and, um, Maybe Mr. Boss could come and help us with our budget. <laughs> could send an invite out. Mm -hmm. If there are things you'd rather we do differently, we certainly can consider that. I mean, we've worked quite, you know, quite a bit of time on this, and, and are bringing to you what we think is our best scenario at this point. I'd like to thank the administrative team for all their hard work on this, because I'm sure none of this is popular or enjoyable. And I make a motion to approve the 2014-2015 budget recommendations as presented this evening. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the budget recommendations presented tonight. Thank you. Please have a roll call. Mr. Bembo? Yes. Mrs. Medina? Yes. Mr. Davis? Reluctantly, yes. Mrs. Lee? Yes. Mrs. Hett? Yes. Mrs. Rail? Yes. Mr. Crane? Yes. Thank you, Marie. Next, do we have a discussion and process? Possible action to approve modification of the employee health insurance department. I, I don't believe there are any, any handouts on the direct provision that we have. Um, we'll, I'll, I'll just speak to, to what we're looking at for, for our health insurance renewal at this point in time. And this has is, is been quite a bit of time spent looking and focusing on this. We were um, we fortunate when we went to the WEA Trust for our, our health insurance the, the year prior to have a second year renewal cap of 12%. Um, 
um, going in initially to our review that that's what we were looking at was right at the 12% um, for the renewal um, with one small adjustment in conjunction with having a plan that's that's Affordable Care Act compliant we did have a minimal reduction below that 12% renewal so we are looking at from WEA 10.88% renewal in the end on a health plan that would be the same design as what our employees have had currently, the, the one adjustment from that would be, as, as uh, Dr. Gittman already referred to, is our adjustment on the deductible, the actual deductible that our employees experience. Um, the, as far as the health plan design that we have with WEA Trust, from, from strictly that plan design with WEA, we have deductibles of $2,000 for a single plan, $4,000 for a family plan, but we did put in an HRA to pick up much of, of that deductible amount. Um, it has been reimbursing or covering for employees for a single plan uh, to date. Um, after $300, it's paid $301 up to $2,000 before um, reaching the deductible at WEA. And on a family plan, it was $601 up to $4,000. What we're recommending is adjusting that those marks up to 500 and 1,000 rather than the 300, 600 we've been at. And that equates to the one savings line that, that Colleen had on the green sheet for your budget review. So we did explore many different designs, <coughs> um, different coverages. In the end, I think Ryan brought back to the, to the committee that this was the most budget friendly, uh, the least disruptive to people. And a survey was sent out to staff in regards to the changes that, let's face it, nobody wants to make. But this was probably the most palatable survey results showing. So it it should provide better continuity for our employees as well because they're not going to be seeing a significant uh, change in in the design of, of the plan. I mean, obviously the deductible amount is going to impact them directly and immediately. The increased deductible would take effect on July 1 with, with this renewal. Um, but outside of that, as far as what our employees have become accustomed to in the last year on, on co-pays for doctor visits, um, what the drug card is that we have in the plan right now, um, co-pays for things like uh, like emergency room visits and things of that nature, that's all the same. So, so from that perspective, the design our employees will be familiar with and will have another year to, to go with this particular renewal. I would, I would just like to clarify, it impacts every employee in this room, too. And, uh, he's not talking about a group of other employees. It includes all employees in the yeah, district. Yeah, all, all district employees that are currently on the, the group health plan. Um, some other things that, that I would add is um, we did review pretty extensively a lot of these details with the district insurance committee that has represent, representation from all of, uh, of our employee groups. John Kring serves as the as the board rep and the committee does recommend going with this renewal with this design plan and, and this renewal based on everything that we've reviewed and looked at um, dan and i have had a number of meetings with um, with our broker um, m3 um, jamie mcdonald and john royce and we really do not believe that even if we were to go to bid this year that we would be getting a better renewal than than what we were guaranteed from wea trust um, in that second year when we signed up with them a year ago. So we, we really don't believe we could do any better. And in fact, we're, when um, we've done some comparisons to our neighboring school districts, our, the premiums for our plan, uh, for comparable plans, are better than Stevens Point and Marshfield. Our, our premiums are lower. So we're in very good shape um, with the renewal that we're looking at right now. And our loss ratio last year was very high. What was it? They projected it would have been a 20 Two percent increase if, uh, we renewal, if we were going straight off from that, off from a utilization and then loss ratio, correct? What has been the uh, staff uh, has <coughs> with the service that they've gotten this year? The, that would that was a part of the survey that that what, that we had administered, and and yes, a significant number of our employees. I think it was just under 80 percent had indicated they were satisfied or very satisfied with the uh, WEA trust. Did we did we look at 400, 800 deductible? I mean, going from three to five and six to a thousand. 
what's, is there a major difference, or is there a difference of 400, 800? I mean, that's the only thing that bothers me is the right. big jump in deductible. I, to be honest, John, when we were looking at it, I think this was the smallest increase we were looking at. We were actually looking at going higher. We were looking at as much as 750, 1500 at, at one point in time. I think this was coming down from some of the, the early reviews that we were taking a look at. It's like bitter pill to swallow. It just keeps going. Just keeps getting hotter. Yeah. Do you need a motion on this? Yes. How do we uh, approve the modifications to the employee health insurance deductible as so stated? Second. Okay, we have a motion to second to approve the modifications to the health insurance deductible. I'm trying to state the amounts. I believe it was five hundred thousand. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Thanks, Ryan. Next, we have discussion of possible action to approve the dental insurance renewal okay. rate. Uh, Ryan and I um, visited Delta Dental a week ago Monday. We met with some of the represent representatives there, and we also had uh, M3, our consultant, uh, with us when we met with them. One of the proposals um, that they proposed was uh, possibly self-funding. Um, we might realize some savings from that. Uh, majority, majority of their uh, insurers are self-funded, and uh, there are districts much smaller than us that are self-funding the dental. Um, so based on that, we uh, had a discussion with them. Um, our renewal is uh, that they uh, Delta Dental posed to us was a 7.5% increase. Uh, M3 reviewed that renewal and determined that uh, self-funding could come in slightly lower than that, a possible savings of $12,000. Um, so what we're proposing is that we do self-fund. Uh, Delta Dental then would uh, charge us each week for the claims that have been submitted and, and uh, verified by them and deducted directly from our checking account and uh, similar to the HRA, similar to the way the HRA works. Um, and uh, we're proposing that we just charge a premium that we would have been assessed had uh, we uh, stayed self uh, fully funded and then uh, at the end of the year see if there's a savings uh, based on the activity for the year. And uh, possibly some money we could then use to help offset the budget uh, uh, increases we'll have next year. And so that's what we're proposing at this time. Um, we uh, are recommending that we self-fund our dental. Do, do any board members have questions about self-funding? Yeah, explain it a little more. <coughs> explain it a little more. Oh, explain it a little more. Um, the, uh, dental is a relatively stable uh, insurance, in other words, from year to year, there's not a lot of fluctuation. Um, people go in annually to have their cleanings, or, or twice a year to have their cleanings, and it doesn't. There's not a lot of fluctuation in the in the activity in a dental plan. Um, based on that, they can project pretty closely to what the activity is going to be. However, the insurance company always builds in a margin. Uh, we will have to pay a uh, policy. Uh, pre, uh, a policy uh, charge per policy of four dollars and twenty-eight cents per month. Four dollars and twenty-eight cents. Four dollars and twenty-eight cents per policy per month um, to have them administer our plan, and then they will, based on <coughs> the claims that are sent, and they actually deduct that amount uh, each week and then monthly for the. Uh, fee uh, from a checking account that we designate for them. And what if what if um, the expenses go beyond what we have in our checking account? Uh, it would it would cost the district it would cost the district money. Yes. And I know that generally these bigger providers um, or the bigger insurance companies are getting better discounts. 
like they'll basically dictate to the dental office how much they'll pay for cleaning. Are we still going to get those discounts, or does that go away? For some we will time? still get the <coughs> excuse me. We still get the same discounts. Everything that we're currently receiving from them, there's no change. Our employees. Uh, let me explain this too. Our employees will not notice a change. They can use the existing cart that they have based on their subscriber number on that card. Even though the group number changes, um, the subscriber number remains the same, and they can use their dental card the same way they have been. Um, so there's no change. The employee will not notice any change. So what elective services? Are there any whitening and seasoning and all this business? No change in services. There's no change in the plan at all. It's at pretty basic. It, it's a basic plan. It, it plus, does not include whitening. Plus, dental is capped at thousand dollars a year. So it's mm -hmm. yes. There's a, there's Anything cap beyond a thousand, you pay. I believe it's six hundred. I think I believe it's six hundred dollars per, per individual, um, and um, that's why it's relatively stable uh, insurance. So if we go along, is we take another twelve thousand off the deficit? Oh. No, well, we we apply we, that. Yeah. We apply that. Next year. Next year. Okay. Any other questions? Hearing none, I would make a motion to approve the dental insurance renewal rates and self funds. Okay, we have a motion second to approve the dental insurance renewal rate, and that included a 7.5% increase in the current rates. Along with uh, being self funded by the district, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, next we have updates and reports on potential modifications being considered for the employee sick leave bank. In your board packet, you would have received that all this golden rod or yellow type colored sheet that shows the, um, the current. Uh, description of the district wide sick, sick leave bank that's in operation or that was put into operation in the district. In addition to that, um, prior to the meeting, I distributed a, a two sheet um, white, white paper copy that stapled together um, recommended update um, that we put together related to the, the sick leave bank that we have available for employees in the district. Uh, just a couple of items that, that I touch upon um, from a historical perspective is that. The sick bank has its origins with the uh, WERDA, -E the teacher union contract um, from some years ago. Uh, there was language written into how that operated. Um, and prior, I should say, following um, the CBA from 07 to 09, um, there were updates um, to that original system that was put in place, which resulted in this yellow copied sheet of paper that you have um, for what's in place today. Not only was that benefit expanded um, in, in options available to employees, but it went district-wide. Originally, it was just available to the teacher group. It went to an all-employee arrangement. Um, it, what we have for you tonight, is this is an updated report. Uh, we're just presenting this as a proposal that we uh, went at this. We're not looking for action this evening. Uh, we will be coming back in June and hoping for an approval. So I've just got a few details reviewed today, unless there are, are more questions. but. Um, as as the, the system's been put in place and been operating in the last few years, um, it, it, has, it has grown in utilization and it is becoming cost to, to the district. Um, the original intent of this when it was put in place or the, back when it was within the teacher group was, for example, to be utilized and made available for the employee and the employee only. Um, the last update that went into place expanded the availability of it to include um, family members outside of the employee. Part of the intent behind this was um, for individuals that may be low on sick leave that they have available to themselves to be able to try to help them get by until a long-term disability policy would become available. You know, as well as the fact that it was really intended originally to be for catastrophic events, life-threatening events, and the because the access to it has been expanded beyond those limited use intentions, it's gotten to the point where it's being accessed pretty extensively and, and it is creating a situation where we've, it's kind of basically grown to where the district's providing a short-term disability benefit and that's really not what it was intended to be about. 
So the main adjustments that we're looking at is to bring it into more of a, a, a district-wide bank that, that employees could donate to rather than specific circumstances and specific individuals. Um, as well as is narrowing it down to where it's a benefit that's available to the employee for their uh, their catastrophic events and, and the employee only, not extended to family circumstances and situations. And I would just back up what Ryan is saying because I authored the initial language over many years ago with um, representatives from the WRA to put it together and negotiate it. At that time, it was strictly for the teachers and strictly for the employees, not for extended family members. When we when we worked on, on drafting this recommended update, what we did do actually is begin with the original document that Colleen just referred to that was in place with the WREA contract uh, that ended after the 07-09 CBA. Um, the sheet that I handed out at the beginning of the meeting that is stapled together, if you look to the, the second page, that is the back copy, um, what you'll see in, in that edition, similar to how we bring forward um, board policy changes where we have the original language and then we slash out wording and, and bold face um, edits. Um, this second sheet is starting with the original sick bank language that was in the teacher contract back in the 07-09 CBA and we edited out from that original language, you know, editing things like you know, taking out the word teachers and putting in employees because the intent of this is to be available to all employees groups as well as adjusting some other the other language within that so that's what page two of this um, additional handout um, reflects and then the cover page is just if it were all cleaned up in, in one one smooth flowing document what that would look like if, if those edits went through so this oh. How are, how are we paying non or non employee sick leave? You're saying we were paying for somebody's spouse? In, other words, in other words, the, the original intention of this was that if you, as an employee, had a catastrophic illness, life threatening right. illness, you were eligible to take some sick days. Now it's, it's um, come out as if you have a child who has that illness, you take off. And, and use sick leave to be gone with your child who's ill. Okay. And that was never the intention of this. And, and it, it basically comes down to the types of leaves that would, would otherwise that, that are um, that qualify for family medical leave. And it, we we do have some situations where it's it's turned into an, an annual event. And and obviously, if the, the individual is expend, has expended their their leave down to zero, and then. You know, each year is uh, looking at getting 60 additional days beyond what they would be entitled to as an individual, and it's it's for certain family circumstances that are not impacting right. the specific employee themselves. And again, it really was intended for catastrophic life threat. Right. Right. You still have some flexibility in, in situations where. Oh yeah, and, and again, as, as Clean is alluding to, this really was intended. We have an employee that can, you know, that comes up with a life-threatening disease or accident or some situation um, where we've got this flexibility to help get them a little bit closer to a long-term disability benefit if if they don't have uh, 90 days pulled up um, to get them to that point in time, and they clearly are not able to work because of the situation that they're facing. We. We still will have people that are drawing on this. We have had circumstances this year where we've got employees that would still qualify even <coughs> under this new language. So we're not asking for action tonight. We just wanted to bring it to your attention, give you kind of the background, some information for you to think about it, and we'll likely bring it back next month. <coughs> Our recommend, recommendation would be that we put this into effect um, with the July 1 effective date. Questions. We can move on to further direction regarding facility group work. Um, 
So we started this process a couple of years ago when Tom Hunter was still here, and he started looking at all our buildings and maintenance needs and things that were not done as a result of having gone to referendum and, and um, had a listing of, of all the dollars and cents that we take. And then um, Ed came on board, and so we started a revisit um, of those, those items. Um, I sent something to you that, that would give you an idea that we met several, on several occasions. Um, their committee members are listed, um, Ed Allison, Phil, Ryan, Trudy, myself, Rod, um, Leslie, Paul, Brian, Ron, Patty, Kathy, and Dan. Um, at times, certain members couldn't be there, but in general, we all met um, together. We talked about um, several different topics. And as you can see, um, we talked pros and cons of several different configurations, everything from a um, early childhood 5K center um, to a 4K sixth grade, um, all kinds of different configurations. Um, basically what we're doing is, is looking at this as part of our strategic plan, we were to look at our facilities. Um, for long-term savings and efficiencies, um, we feel obligated to investigate these kinds of things. Um, so that we, we are um, presenting efficient use of resources. Um, this, it, it, any change that we were we would bring forward um, to you would not be for next year. I want to make that clear to anybody in the public and anybody in this room. We're not looking to bring forth a change for next year. Um, we see status quo in our buildings for next year. Um, if we were to make a change, we would be looking at the year after, um, potentially. Um, this is not any change that we make here, um, and, and again tonight we're not we're not going to make any changes. But um, any any direction we might go is not going to solve an entire budget problem. Um, so I don't want you to be looking at this as oh this is how we're going to solve the budget because that's not going to happen. There will be some savings certainly, but it's more a matter of looking at our buildings and are we using them as efficiently as we could. Um, When we have this discussion, we can do, you know, if we come up with some kind of a, uh, a recommendation to you, we could do it all at once. We could do it as a phase in. We could do step, you know, one step one year and another step the next year. We need to have some kind of long range discussion about, about where the board, um, you know, sees this going. Um, or if we do nothing, um, there will also eventually be a cost. So I think we need to have an active discussion about it. Um, because if we, you know, that would be one option, and that is to do nothing. Um, but you'll have buildings then that you'll that will need repair and ongoing maintenance um, that may not otherwise, you know, be subject to that. Um, we may at some point need to ask you for some expertise from the outside. Um, we have data from 2005, 2004, 2005 capacity numbers. Um, you know what it is per square foot, how many students would fit. Um, program programmatically, etc. Um, those things change over time, and um, we may we may need to ask you for that that permission. Um, so we looked at all the buildings um, and and what they were costing and utilities and maintenance needs and so on. We re we reviewed restructuring options, um, and in fact, option number one from 2005 was implemented, and that was making Rams a six seven, and this building an eight nine. In 2005, option two presented was to move the ninth grade to Lincoln High School. At that time, um, it was shared with you that um, 10 rooms had been used for, were currently, at, at that time, were being used for EEN and ELL. When the building was initially put together, only four rooms were being used. So you can see where there's a, pro a programmatic shift. Um, five rooms were used for technological reasons. Um, zero were used. They were all classrooms prior to that. So in other words, computer labs and things of that nature. Um, five classrooms over there are being used for special programs, such as the volunteer, the student volunteer group, um, CCHI, our, our um, Central, Cell, Central City Health Institute, um, in-house uh, suspension, that type of thing. Rooms were scheduled at about 80%. Now last week I talked with someone who indicated, and, and they are um, someone who does the, I don't, know if, I don't remember if he was an architect or someone who just helps you work through a process of, of building facilities, but indicated that normally buildings are scheduled at 80% and that's considered at capacity, that 
you don't schedule any building at 100% where all rooms at all times are being used. Um, fundamental question I think that we have to talk with you about um, this evening is, you know, does ninth grade belong in your minds at the high school so that we have a 912 building? Um, back, back in 2005 when this was brought forward as an option, um, it indicated that most high schools in Wisconsin are currently four-year high schools. Um, ninth grade students um, are earning credit towards graduation. Um, they participate in several, but not all, um, high school co-curricular activities. So there are a variety of things, you know, pros and cons. Um, we also included, if you uh, turn the page, kind of a listing then of pros and cons which you sent ahead just to give you something to look at. Um, if you were to go with a 912. Um, and I don't think I need to read, read those over to you unless you have a, a question about those. Um, I think, I, uh, I, did, I do want to, what about, there's two areas that I don't see that I know we discussed back then, um, locker room space, Well, and in lockers themselves. And Ron, I, I know we've talked about the girls' locker room athletic facility is going to need some upgrading regardless of what happens. Um, but as far as lockers, I believe we have enough. We have 1,915 lockers. Okay. 1,915. And 15. <laughs> <laughs> and 15. <laughs> 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 um, and locker room. Well, they're numbered. But, but yeah, you just go to the last one, Ron. <laughs> no, no, there's a gap. So there's a gap in the numbers. But locker room, you mean as in Fayette? The Fayette locker room space and thoughts about that? Yeah, in the uh, we don't feel there's an issue in the male locker room. That locker room was remodeled. Ryan, how many years? Four, four, four years. Five. Four years ago. Yeah. Um, we do have to do something with the female locker room. Moving freshmen or not moving freshmen, it's an area of concern. Um, the lockers are different than the male locker rooms. Um, transferring kids in and out of those current lockers, there's enough in there currently, depending upon what we would do for a possible renovation, plays into that. Our girls' locker room is not very well set up for having hosting athletic events because there's not a divider like there is in the male locker room. Before you sit down, mm -hmm. um, so philosophically, you have to think about whether or not ninth grade goes to Lincoln. Ron, did you did schedule? Um, how did you do that? Uh, I did, took this year's master schedule at Lincoln, and then I took East's master schedule of the current ninth grade. And you know there is some fluctuation in that because East does run classes with eighth and ninth graders on it. So there's, it's not an exact um, and. The East schedule does fit into Lincoln. Um, there are some modifications that would need to be made with some rooms. Uh, we are we would need to add a science lab uh, at Lincoln, and, and we've looked at that already. Ed and I have had multiple conversations what that may involve, and uh, it may also involve dividing a few rooms, such as the 112 study hall on first floor, which may need to get divided into two classrooms, either with a permanent wall or a movable uh, movable wall. It does schedule us tight uh, at Lincoln, and I, I don't want to say what percentage it is, because to be honest with you, I didn't sit down and figure out what rooms. I just said, all right, East needs this many size classrooms. If I go through my schedule, this is how many classrooms I have empty during the day. Um, for example, this current year's schedule, I could fit all of East science at Lincoln, but every one of the science rooms would be used every hour of the day. And we do know that we've added a science requirement in uh, for this for three credits and so we know there's going to be a necessity for an additional science classroom and so that's the area that was probably the the tightest to look at uh, is in the science area you think only one class? yeah we believe we can have one classroom at this time you know, the recommendation in the study that we were up to from eight to ten rooms yeah. and we currently have some classrooms at Lincoln this year that sit vacant during the day completely completely part of the reason is is our teachers aren't teaching six out of seven now so that has led to a staff reduction um, if we did move the teachers would be traveling again like they like they used to you know you leave a classroom and someone would come in during that 
during that prep time. So in other words, teachers may not have a classroom for prep? Correct. They may go somewhere else? We currently have offices for all our departments at Lincoln and under previous administration those were probably used quite frequently because that was where the teachers went during their prep time. Currently, we don't need the double, double book classroom for a teacher to prep in that classroom and then also to have a classroom. It's, it's vacant. We know that we know that body count. I mean, body-wise, there's room um, because we've been up to 1,600. I think the first year that we're forecasting, if it would be in two years, it'd be 1,535. I think is the number for or 1,565 because our current sophomore class is the la is the largest class in the district, and so once they graduate, I think it drops down to 1,520 or 1,530. That would be at Lincoln. I mean, the question, I mean, you know, philosophically, we may agree. Um, I know Ron has done some some scheduling, as you're indicating, and, and looking at where we need a wall. And so there was some, you know, and then the costs. Other, other issue is lunch. Yeah, we would have to go back to three, we'd go to three lunches. Currently, we have two lunches under the current year schedule, which we'll maintain for next school year. We would go back to the three lunches. and. As we talked about in January when I did the scheduling update, we're looking at a different schedule also at Lincoln. And that plays into this also. What would that do? What would that do? How it would play into the... Yeah, if ninth grade were there. If ninth grade were there, I have to run that if that's the decision that we continue to move forward. I don't think it would change because you're still teachers are still teaching 12 sections. So I don't think the, the physical space would change because teachers would still be teaching 12 sections. There would be no change in the number of... That my, I'll, I'll tell you, my concerns right up front are that it's scheduled very tight already just from, from a, a first glance. Um, and then I'm also concerned, what if we have more students That's for whatever right. reason? Um, how, you know, what's, what's the capacity going to be? And frankly, with a programmatic change, I don't know. And, and when you looked at this back in 2005, certainly the numbers have changed and probably some of the programs. So it, it's, it's one of those things that I guess we're looking to you to say, okay, and, and <coughs> stop with that for a minute and say, okay, if, if ninth grade goes to Lincoln, then what? There's a domino effect. And so then we look at, we have East now with eighth graders. Do we just have eighth graders at East? Do we look at a six, seven, eight configuration at East? Um, we've started to look at that just to see what happens. Um, it could be scheduled again. It's very tight. Um, we looked at um, the middle school as well. Um, you know, that's that's a decision then to six, seven, eight. If, if that were a configuration, would that be here at East? Would it be at, at Rams? Um, we also looked at you know, do we do a five, six, and a seven, eight, and then you have K four buildings. Um, we were looking at a six, seven, eight because we felt it reduced transitions, and it's. I think it's difficult for kids to, to get attached to a building of teachers in a two-year time frame. I mean, they're they're jumping from elementary to middle school to junior high to high school. We had three transitions before we restructured. We'd be going back to three transitions instead of four. Um, I don't know if we have many of the people sitting out here are members of the. The facilities committee, and I don't know if there are things that you would like to add or, or interject at this point. Anybody who's no, okay. I'm just <laughs> giving the option. I told him I would. Um, so I think I think the fundamental question really is: Do you think ninth grade, be, you know, belongs belongs at, at the high school? What I don't want to do is bring some. I don't want to bring a recommendation to you until we really have all the eyes dotted and the T's crossed. And I don't. We're not there. Um, and, and we've gone around and around about a number of things and really looked at a lot of detail and a lot of numbers. And um, we just, I think, need direction from you. Not a vote necessarily, but yes, keep pursuing this. Um, we think ninth grade belongs probably at Lincoln. We'd like to get some real detail on that. Just my opinion, philosophically, ninth graders belong in high school. They're they're being graded for high school credit. Uh, their expectations are they'll take high school programming. Um, I just hope that we don't box ourselves up too tight. That's uh, my concern. Who knows what's going to happen in this community? We don't seem to have something sitting out there that's going to drop 
influx of people here, but it's, you, know, you don't want to be to the point where you have an increase of 100 students and all of a sudden you're having to go to referendum to build the classroom space to handle. Or the, the bigger elephant in the room is we got two fairly well remodeled buildings, East and Rams. What do you do with them then? I mean, well, you can't very well mothball those two big buildings. Well, we have eighth grade still that needs to be somewhere. Right. And sixth and seventh grade. Right, right. So if, if you do a six, seven, eight, and, and let's say they, they, if we schedule them into, into Rams or into East, um, we laid out kind of pros and cons and, and what that would cost. And, and again, this is our estimate. This is Ed helping us with, with some of the square footage um, issues that he knows about. Ron actually had somebody come and take a look you know, at the building as far as putting up a wall, taking out a wall. Um, we need to look at them. If, if, if we're at East, what do we do with ramps? Do we make that an elementary? I mean, the conversation just keeps moving along. We make that a large elementary. So, you know, where does it where does it lead to? Other thoughts? Just like full circle. But you're talking about the transition dynamic. Back in the day. Um, I went to Grove School, it was K-4, and then Woodside was 5, 6, 7, and then, you know, but we are talking about how many transitions the kids had, but I don't think, for, I don't think that's a big deal, personally, I mean, because I was, I lived on the same block my entire life, and I went to kindergarten at Woodside, first, second, third, fourth at um, Grove, and then fifth, sixth, seventh at Woodside, and then eighth and ninth at West, no, eighth at West, ninth at East, that was when the changeover was, and I mean, so, I mean, and, but, you're not the only person moving, so you've got you know a group of kids are all together kind of as a. I don't think the transition is a huge deal. I do think it is scary the idea of that if we run out of space at the high school because it sounds like it's just too confined right now at the, what we're looking at right now. Well, and again, if you look at, at doing nothing, then the conversation is going to shift and it's going to be okay. What do you what do you want to put into the buildings that we have as far as what the structural needs are? Would it be helpful for you to see that listing of yes. dollars and cents that, that would yes. need, be needed to build it? We need to, yeah. I mean, I know he's been working on it, but I'd like to see we what had it before. Well, yeah, but that's 2004. Right, I know, but I mean, we had it before and it was helpful then, so it's helpful now. I, you know, I, yes, I, I would have to say I agree. The 912, it should be, but. Lincoln was never built to be a 912 building, so it wasn't designed. And I do have concerns about, you know, I, you know athletic space. You know, you're bringing a full grade over there. They have different health classes. They have different needs. Right? You know, and, and scheduling the rooms tight. You know, in the locker room facilities and the gym class and the space and everything else. You know, and, and then you know, if we're going to schedule with all the increased credits in science, you know. We really need two science rooms, not one. Even though as we go forward, because you know, if, if we have the ninth grades over there, then they're going to have some some added added needs too. But I I know when we went through this whole thing, we were looking at building utilization, and one day, oh yeah, schedule at ninety five percent. And he said, no, we don't understand. You can't just because if you had you know, one issue of it, expansion of twenty students would throw off that whole building. Right? You know that type of thing, and that's my concern. Is if we do make a change, and if something would come in with with Renaissance or something with with you know, some of those other software companies coming in and, and, and bringing hopefully bringing workforce back into the community, what would we do if we had an increase of 50 or 100 students? Oh, we also want to plan for the future in the sense that East isn't going to last probably forever. No, I mean it's a very good sound structure, and Ed would say probably 20 more years. But you also want to be thinking beyond us sitting at this table, what do we envision? What do we envision? John, you mentioned athletics. Right now we're trying, most ninth graders come up for practices and such, and very few I'm, I'm referring to gym class. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and we feel we have enough stations for that, meeting with that department between the upper gym and the, and the stations in the weight room and the pool. I mean, we're, we're, we're fortunate to have that athletic area that we do. The other area that I failed to mention, there will be some scale of efficiency if freshmen move because if they offer a class of algebra one of 24 here and we offer so there is some scale of efficiency which I did not build in initially and I think that's why Dr. Dickman originally said if you're philosophically with the 912 
we need to dive in. I'm not an architect. I don't get all the square footage and need to dive in a little bit more on that. Well, no, but I mean, I have the same concerns that John's talking about, but with what you're just saying, too, I think that opens up some possibilities. There are some ninth graders who maybe would take a class that they wouldn't have normally taken that would have been offered at the high school, but they have to be bust over for whatever reason. They weren't able to take a class, and then they have those opportunities <coughs> open to them to maybe, um, ex you know, explore other areas that maybe they wouldn't have done before or to take other classes that they wouldn't, maybe wouldn't have had the opportunity to take before. And I would echo the same. I think philosophically they belong together. I'm just concerned about the space. Right. What do our students think? <laughs> <laughs> well, as a ninth grader, I probably would have liked to be at Lincoln just because you're supposed to act like you're in high school, but you're still treated like you're in middle school, so maybe treated more like well, if, if Phyllis, I mean, if I heard that philosophically you would suggest, yeah, you think it, it, it's a 912, but there are some concerns, and I think we, as a group, are meeting again later this week. I think we're hearing the, what the concerns are. Um, would you be willing, um, you know, Ed's been in touch with, with um, Steve Kike for. He's worked with us multiple times um, and has actually done the last kind of capacity study. Um, I think we'd be silly not to have mm -hmm. that done. I, I, I don't know what the cost of it was last time, though, that he came and did such a study. Um, and do you have an idea of what? He, he, did, a, he did a very comprehensive, I mean, you can, you can spend $12,000 to get a facility piece. I'm not interested in that that kind of an expenditure. I wouldn't want to go even beyond five thousand if we had to come in and do anything. And I don't know if you would be willing to have us go that direction. Um, but I, I, we don't need a. There's a lot that we can do because we know what the programs are and what the spaces are and, and how we can shift kids around and, and, and utilize space. But um, well, he would have a lot of the background that he did in 2005, wouldn't he? But that's 10, I mean, it's, it's a 2004, actually, and that's but I mean, so the 10 building years ago. Right, the building structure has, has The fire so. codes may have changed and capacities and... From a facilities standpoint, I think that we have a pretty good handle on maintenance needs, future maintenance needs. Yeah. The part that we don't have is the new programming, you know, the, the RTI stuff built into the scheduling now, and space needs are are different where the space is the same i mean that's kind of the, the missing piece I know architects they'll, they'll do a facility study from a maintenance and budget and upkeep standpoint and then they also do educational space studies so you know how much room is needed for a science classroom how many classrooms are needed for x number of kids and that's maybe the part that we need help with and I would think we'd be remiss not to get that done before we make any decisions on that. I mean, we ought to know that the, the facility, I mean, it comes back and says you're going to need six more classrooms, we're going to need to know that before we make that decision. And, and we think we could make it work, but we would like to have some expert in this field because we don't want to go forward and then find out what really doesn't work and we should have yeah. accessed that expertise at the time. The department has been encouraging schools for years now to take their 18 to 21 year old programs and move them out of high school buildings so that they truly are away from that school setting more like that search mm -hmm. uh, pieces is, is trying to move students to there are some classrooms um, that are housing those those students and a lot of districts have been able to take that jump um, it's something that could be looked at. Um, I, I'm going to say that we have some parents and it's hard for our department in terms of the transitions. Um, duplicating uh, the programming and, and equipment needs for the more severe handicaps. It's, um, RAMS was set up with a lot of equipment to handle the very serious uh, and significant physical health needs. We have tracks, we have um, lifts, and, and things for changing larger students. That's not built into this building over here. We had 
when I was at my prior district just gone to the six, seven, eight, nine, and then 10, 12 high school piece and worked through some of those issues. In special ed, it cost us additional staff because we were recreating in two buildings and then we ended up doing something a little bit different. The state said it was okay, but the very significant, who really have a hard time getting used to a building, it takes longer for them to get uh, very attuned to what's going on and, and staff to be consistent. It takes a long time to get to know some of our kids. They would stay an extra year at the middle school level, skip the junior high, and, and go straight to Lincoln. And we've done that with a few students here to ease up on one of those transitions. So there are some other pieces there that, for the average student, you know, popping through a few different buildings at a time, it's not that big of a deal. But for some students, it's pretty bad. Not bad, it's pretty difficult, and it sets us back with them, you know, emotionally and, and academically for a while until they can recover. Shutter East Junior High. What is Shutter? What do you mean by that? Oh, to close the, the building. I mean, just close it and vacate it. Difficult to assess. <coughs> you know that it's still it's still a viable it's still a viable building. Okay. What does that have to do with central office and technology? Because, because they they're it's only it's adults and they don't listen to the fire alarm. <laughs> No, the heating shut system it is all part of the building. It's, if you shut that down, this isn't working. Essentially, it's all connected. Okay. That's one building. Okay. So if you were to shutter East Junior High, for example, and close it down, got it. We need to go somewhere. You mean close it down completely, not just for a fire? Okay. Yeah. That's what I didn't understand. Kathy, do you have anything to add to that? Was that part of that discussion? Well, the reason I'm asking Kathy is because she was at the at this particular meeting. Um, I think in talking about the 6-8 configuration, we have talked a lot about whether it would be better to place 6-8 at Rams or East, and which building would be more beneficial and provide meet the needs of the 6-8 student. And one of the things we discussed is if we put the 6-8 at Rams, where would central office and the technology departments go? Um, they really wouldn't fit into any other building because we would be maximizing our capacity of the other buildings by doing this. We wouldn't have the, the you know, vacant space in buildings that perhaps we have now. And so that left a big hole, if you will. So that's why um, we, we felt it was important to, to note that. If, if we did put the 6-8 at, Ram, at Rams and closed East, we'd still really need to run East just for the adults in central office and in technology. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, what about um, Children's Choice? The, is there room there? I, that, that's I for a different no. discussion. If you keep River Cities where it is now, um, we pretty much use that building to its capacity. There's a few vacant rooms there, but um, not more than two. So you couldn't accommodate technology and central office at, at um, River Cities. So, so what we're going to do is, is we're going to really get some detail on if if we move back to great, uh, we'll we'll try to figure out who we want to speak with and find out what the costs will be to have someone with expertise come and confirm that with us or work through some of those details with us. Once we see whether that works or not, and you as a board vote yes, we want to move ninth grade to Lincoln, we decide when. And we also then need to have what, what might be the next step, and that would be the next part of that discussion. Um, we'll have, again, some options that we've already started looking at um, available to you. If you have any um, 
comments or, or thoughts as we, you know, as the days go by or the weeks go by, we don't see each other. Um, you know, feel free to give me a call and, and we'll include that in our discussion. Anybody else have anything out, out there? I just don't want to, many of the committee members are here, so I don't want to overlook this. Nope. Just as far as the 6 8 concept, um, curricularly, just like 9 12 fit together, 6 8 fit together as well. And when we, we as a committee, talked a lot about the transition piece, and you know, behaviorally, kids at that 6 8 level struggle and relationships are very important and that's why the committee was leaning toward the 6-8 configuration if we can make it fit and the reason is then you can create those relationships create that identity with the school and hopefully eliminate some of those behavior issues whereas the, the model we have now the kids are in they're out they're in they're out but of course we have to make sure we have the capacity in the buildings we also could do, I mean, eighth grade usually fits with a middle school model. You know, are there some better curricular things we could do with those eighth graders if they're with those sixth and seventh graders? So those are all conversations that we've been having that I think are important to think about. Okay. And now move on to discussion and possible action to approve moving the district virtual school elementary program from the Vesper Community Academy to the Grant Elementary site location beginning in the 2014-15 school year. In the previous month's uh, regular board meeting, uh, we had brought forward the agenda item of uh, our review of the virtual program's review of switching locations. Um, as I had described at that point in time, uh, some of the issues that we're taking a look at is space availability uh, at Vesper, given uh, their needs for regular brick and mortar instruction, as well as the fact that our uh, number of families taking advantage of the Friday experience with our virtual program has expanded out to where we have three different classrooms that, that we've been running at the 4K through grade five level. Um, in addition to uh, the fact that we're looking to be able to expand our in-building tutoring activities that we're running with parents. In other words, as we've expanded, it's become increasingly difficult for the virtual teaching staff to make home visits, uh, to catch up on instruction and provide tutoring services. Uh, we'd like to encourage more of a model of um, having our teaching staff available in a building uh, that the, uh, we would encourage our parents to bring their children into uh, and with the vast number of our of our families that are participating in district are here closer in and around the city of Rapids and the fact that more of our non-resident families are now coming from areas like Stevens Point um, our recommendation I hope it would be to move the the virtual program um, to operate out of the, the Grant Elementary building and looking at the district facilities here closer in and around the city of, of Wisconsin Rapids Grant Elementary has the, the most space available for us to be able to, to move in and, and utilize rooms that are available there. So I, I guess I, I'd like to, to be able to field any questions that, that board members may have. What does it affect on, on Fridays? Doesn't uh, Westbrook Community Academy have partial day and then the specials are expanded for virtual students to come in? How does that impact the classrooms at Grant? Where they have a full day of instruction on Friday? It, it, it would involve needing to make some modifications to the way in which the specials schedule would operate. Um, as you're alluding to, John, there is, there's, as far as music and, and art and PE classes are a little bit more heavily loaded on those Fridays right now to be able to accommodate those additional sections. Um, what this would involve then would be modifying a special schedule at the elementary level so that there are there's more special sections added to grant and would need to specifically be scheduled in to those Friday afternoons. You did a survey on something of the uh, the parents or the families from the virtual school and did they have any comments or concerns about it? We, we've not heard any, any strong opposition against it. Um, have you, spoke, have you spoken to them? The, the staff has had communication with them about what our, our intent is. And you know, I have not received any contact on the negative side of things. And um, you know, it, it really is hard to know exactly what sort of 
impact it's going to have or exactly how many students are going to show on those Fridays until we make that shift. Um, uh, but the other thing as far as participation right now, if we're talking geographically, um, we have, um, and, and I, there's, we have one family that is right in Vesper that attends on Fridays, and we have one family, and the, the Vesper family, it varies from week to week. Not all of the kids come. There are some older students that are, that are secondary level, so they wouldn't be attending anyway. Uh, so it does vary, but it, we're talking three or four students from in Vesper, and then we have one family of two students from ARPAN that is open and rolled in from the Alberdale School District. You know, geographically speaking, that's that's the, the, all we have number-wise that are attending Vesper on Fridays. The, the, the rest, rest are, are coming from are coming from here closer to city proper, as well as we have some families coming from Adams. We have a family from Adams Friendship, um, some families from Nakusa that are attending. I would move we approve the move of the virtual school from Vesper Grant. Second. <coughs> no further discussion. Uh, we have a motion and a second to approve the moving of the district virtual school elementary program from the Vesper Community Academy building to the Grant Elementary site location beginning in the 2014-15 school year. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. That's all we have under new business. With that, we have some calendar. Oh, we have some calendar items. I think yes. Dan does for the negotiation. Yes, transportation. Yeah. Um, we did contact our contractors, our transportation contractors. Um, all of them are available on Wednesday. Um, Al Lamers would not be available on Monday. So, which um, Wednesday? Pardon me, first. Fourth Wednesday. And uh um, May nineteenth and May twenty first were the two dates that we're given for that's time. next week. Um, is there a time we had we had a slot of a time between eleven and four. Um, we probably want to meet as a committee prior to meeting with the contractors. Um, do you have a time and preference? We're gonna meet with them for five hours. No. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to meet at 11, um, it maybe us as a committee should meet at 11 and then maybe a half hour later. Maybe, so 11.30 or is that? That's okay. Okay. I will uh, notify them Wednesday at 11.30 for the uh, full uh, team and then uh, just our committee would meet at uh, 11 o'clock. Where? It'd be here at East, and uh, to it'll either be in this room or the conference room C. I'm not sure which one's open. Hopefully, one of them's open. Okay. Which day are you looking? Twenty-first. Wednesday, the twenty-first. This is twenty. Yeah. It's on the twenty-first. Wednesday. Twenty-first is Wednesday. 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 It'd be twenty-first on the Wednesday, the twenty-first of next week. Eleven o'clock for us. And then 11.30 with the uh, Thank you. All right, anything else? Okay, with that, oh. here. Um, <laughs> yes, one announcement. I, I don't know if um, John mentioned or not. We're planning the virtual tour for the virtual uh, <laughs> tour. The real <laughs> construction. The at 4.30. Yes, yeah. at 4.30. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Now, with that word, thank you, Emily. And Chris, so welcome. Looking forward to working with you next year. Dad, I enjoyed learning more about you in the paper. Yes. Oh, thank you. yes. Very <laughs> nice. It was very nice. Batman. I have a Facebook video of Batman.